Let's continue. At the beginning of chapter 52, Cervantes alludes again to the theoretical debate about literature. The goat herd's tale caused general delight in all of them. Then, with the echo of the name Leandra still reverberating in our ears, Don Quixote presumes to know the thoughts and desires of this woman. Were it not for his mission to Micomicon, he says he would intervene on behalf of Eugenio. I would rescue Leandra from that convent where without any doubt she must be held against her will, despite the abbess and all who would oppose me, and I would place her in your hands so that you might deal with her according to your will and pleasure, minding, however, the laws of chivalry, which command that no damsel shall be dealt any disgrace whatsoever. Notice the complex contradictions of our crazy gentleman's reasoning. His final qualification that no woman is to suffer any disgrace sounds like a respectful decree and, in essence, a feminist argument. But Don Quixote is almost always a bivalent figure. If his instinct to rescue Leandra is positive, it also reminds us of what Don Fernando did with Lustina prior to his moral metamorphosis. Would it really be a good idea to give Leandra to Eugenio? And if we think like Marcela, what if Leandra doesn't want to be rescued? In other words, Don Quixote appears to respect women, but then not exactly. Also contradictory, sometimes Don Quixote is too aggressive, although often against those who seem to deserve it. Recall the second barber and the dilemma of bleeding people after the discovery of the circulatory system. One might argue that real individuals do not deserve to be assaulted, but perhaps art expresses a kind of poetic justice. This appears to be the case of the struggle between Don Quixote and Eugenio. Eugenio asks who Don Quixote is, to which the first barber replies, who else could it be but the famous Don Quixote, he who writeth wrongs, the undoer of injustices, the protector of maidens, the terror of giants, and the victor of battles. Eugenio's reaction to the barber contains an architectural allusion to the wineskins episode as well as that of Maritornes and the muleteer. For my part, I wager that either your worship is jesting or this gentleman must have empty chambers in his head. And the reaction of Don Quixote to Eugenio cuts directly to the latter's pride and the etymology of his name. You are a great scoundrel, and it's you who's empty and short on brain. For I am fuller than that tremendous whore of whores who gave birth to you ever was. And now, yet another outbreak of violence. Consider three aspects of this violence. First, once again, there resurfaces the ongoing theme of the mill and milling. Second, the struggle between Don Quixote and Eugenio recalls that between Don Quixote and Cardenio when the wild man lost his mind, except that Eugenio seems more evil soundly thrashed, molido, by Sancho, he went crawling about on all fours looking for a table knife with which to exact some bloody revenge. And third, there is something of an obscene spectacle here, especially in the cruel complicity of the priest, the barber, and the officers, who together hissed them on as they do to dogs that are locked in a fight. Dogs, are always symbolic in Cervantes' texts, reminding us of Anselmo and Lotario, or Anselmo and Eugenio. The metaphor of dogs underlines the absolute equality between two men who behave like beasts. The goat herd got Don Quixote under him and rained down so many punches on the knight's face that it soon streamed with as much blood as his own. They make a great pair, no? Just like the bell of Eugenio's spotted she-goat, a new sound heralds the beginning of a new allegory. They heard the sound of a trumpet, mournful in the extreme, which made them all turn their faces toward where they thought it came from. Don Quixote, more than a little pounded, molido, asks the goat herd for peace. His request suggests the allegorical, moral, and even mystical transformation at the heart of the novel. Brother devil, and it's not possible for you to be otherwise, for you have summoned the courage and strength to vanquish my own. I pray thee, let's call a truce, at least for an hour, because it seems to me that the pitiful sound of that trumpet which reaches our ears calls me to a new adventure. The goat herd, 
who by now was tired of pounding and being pounded, releases our hero and so begins the last symbolic scene of Don Quixote Part 1. By the way, I have counted more than 35 instances of words based on the root moler, meaning to pound or to mill in the 1605 novel. The narrator tells us that a number of men were coming down an embankment, all dressed in white, like penitents. The explanation of what these men are doing reminds us of the description of Don Quixote as having a dry complexion, as well as the mummy in the middle of the labyrinth recently alluded to by Sancho. That year, it so happened that the clouds had denied their moisture to the earth, and so in all the towns of that region, people were making processions, saying prayers, and performing public flagellations, asking God to open his merciful hands and send them rain. Recalling the novel's long list of cloistered women, such as Dorotea, Lucinda, Camila, Leandra, Zoraida, the Maidens of the Lake, and most recently, Leandra, Cervantes uses the indirect free voice to describe how Don Quixote concludes that he faces yet another nightly adventure. His imagination confirmed this to him all the more when he thought that an effigy that they carried dressed in mourning was some principal lady that those great scoundrels and villains were taking away by force. His confrontation of the penitents confirms once again that the knight's calling is to liberate women. Now, courageous company, you will see how important it is that there should be knights in the world who profess the order of chivalry. Now, I say, you will see by the freedom of that good lady who goes captive there whether knights errant deserve our fame. So Don Quixote hurls himself into battle at full gallop because at no point in this true history does one read that Rocinante ever dashed or charged. Poor Rocinante. Like his master, he wants to, but he can't. Sancho, as he did in the adventure of the windmills, tries to restrain his master. Where are you going, Lord Don Quixote? What demons within you incite you to attack our Catholic faith? Oh, devil take me. Know that this is a procession of penitents and that the lady whom they carry on that platform is the blessed image of the Immaculate Virgin. Sin mantilla, he says, meaning without a stain. Don Quixote ignores Sancho and challenges the penitents. I will not allow one more stride to advance forward without giving her the desired freedom she deserves. Two observations here. First, Sancho's words again allude to the theme of racial mixing that we have seen throughout the novel. And second, the final example of laughter in the 1605 novel is a sadistic variety produced by the penitents, a laughter which provokes anger in Don Quixote, turning him into a kind of modern war machine. And they broke out in a fit of laughter, which laughter was like throwing gunpowder on Don Quixote's fury.